We're continuing today, and, and as I jump into this, I'm, I'm sure most of you have flown before, likely many times. You're likely at the point where you get on a plane and you don't really pay much attention to the safety procedures, or even to when the pilot gets on the intercom to speak, half the time you can't understand him anyway. You kind of listen, but not really, until the plane hits any kind of turbulence. Anybody ever been in turbulence before? Then the pilot has your full attention. You even begin to wonder who this pilot is. How much experience does this pilot have? Have they ever gone through this, and are they skilled at getting through this turbulence? In other words, the storm, the turbulence has got your attention, and the pilot has your attention. He captures your attention. We begin to listen to him. We begin to obey, for our safety and our life is in his hands. You know, when everything is going swimmingly and smoothly in life, and the day-to-day -day is just that, the day-to-day, -day, we don't pay much attention to stuff in general until a storm hits, until life starts to feel like it's careening out of control. Then that's all we can think about. It seems oftentimes we're like that with God. As long as everything is going okay, we pay attention, but we don't really pay attention. But when storms hit and all has been stripped away, God has our full attention. That's all we can think about. You know, we're looking at David, and you see in his life this man whose life has had such an impact on really everyone. And you look at David, and what's so beautiful about him is he, he's not perfect. He's far from it. But he did seek after God. And at this point in his life, even though he's already been anointed to be the next king of Israel, even though he's defeated Goliath and continually routed the Philistines, King Saul wants to murder him. And David is on the run. He's hitting some turbulence. Everything has been taken away. To say that he's encountered some turbulence would be quite the understatement. At the end of chapter 20, as we looked at last week, David found out with complete certainty that King Saul intends to murder him. Jonathan, Saul's son and David's close friend, informs David of this. And Jonathan comforts David as best as he can. And David is on the run. He's a man without a country. Really looking at 1 Samuel 21, it seems like everything is spiraling out of control. And you could even look at David and say he's rather panicked. Last week, you heard it in the words he spoke to Jonathan. It, it keeps ringing in my mind. When David looked at Jonathan and said, I am a step away from death. That's literally how David feels. And the wrath of Saul is beginning to wear him down. You ever felt like that? Like everything's careening out of control and you're starting to feel worn down. And David has to be wondering what to do next. As we jump into 1 Samuel 21, what you notice is really throughout the rest of this chapter, or through most of the rest of this chapter, it marks the time when David lives as a refugee with enemies in every direction, and I mean every direction. One commentator simply noted, these nine chapters, chapters 21 through 29, depict David's wilderness experience, because that's what David is going through right now. So let's see what David does. He's been informed that King Saul really does intend to murder him. And right away in verse 1, David goes to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech the priest. He goes to the temple. He goes to the priest. In our modern day, he goes to church. That's where David goes. When life is spiraling out of control, when you feel like you are on the run, when you feel like everything is conspiring against you, I honestly, and I know I speak as a pastor and I have to say that, but I really don't. I can't think of a better place to be than among other believers. I really can't. I mean, you heard Ruth. I love how she was saying that and bringing everything going on in the world. I don't know about you, but when I come here, I'm around other people that I know believe in Jesus. Amen. I don't find that anywhere else. Anywhere else I go, I'm getting beaten down constantly. But when I come here, I'm around other people that go, you know what? Jesus is Lord. And I think that is just so powerful and so beautiful. 
So when you feel like you're on the run, get around other believers, be it at church, be it at small group. I just got to brag. We had our small group last Wednesday, and it was a powerful time. Other believers discussing God's word, which is why it's just so important. So Ahimelech, the priest, sees David, and he looks at him, and he trembles. He's like, why are you all alone? Why is no one with you? For it would not be normal for David to be alone. It would have been strange, even rather dangerous. David would seem to him like a fugitive on the run, which he is. So King David, verse 2, he says, The king has sent me on a private matter. The king told me not to tell anyone why I'm here. I've told my men where to meet me later. They'll be here, believe me. Now, what is there to eat? Give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. The priest replied, we don't have any regular bread, but there is the holy bread, which you can have if your young men have kept themselves pure. David is hungry. David is desperate. Now, before I even go on, there's no getting around the fact that David lied. David lied. He lied to save his life there. Make no mistake about it. People read this. This is what's so powerful. They think it must mean it's okay to lie because it's right there in the Bible. Really, when you look at David fleeing from Saul, you find multiple people lying. You have David lying. You have Jonathan stretching the truth, which is a lie. You have his own wife lying to protect him. The Bible doesn't record this to show us it's okay to lie. No, it's recorded because people lied. It's recorded because people lied. To me, it just proves even more the truthfulness and trustworthiness of God's word. The Bible doesn't cover it up. David lied. In other words, the Bible is being truthful about people who lied. As Eugene Peterson reminds us, David's isn't an ideal life, but an actual life. That's why I love looking at his story. As you see everything about him, it's right there for all of us to read and look at and learn from and stuff not to do and stuff to do. David's life is recorded in the Bible is literally real life. David is a real person. Real people make mistakes. Even people after God's own heart. Real people mess up. Real people sin. Real people tell lies. And God loves us anyway. If you want to get anything about you understand this part, no matter what, God loves me anyway. So verse 5, David is asked for five loaves of bread. No food was available, no other food. The priest gave David the holy bread, the bread of the presence that was placed before the Lord in the tabernacle. David asked for bread. He asked for five loaves. What's interesting about the number five in the Bible is oftentimes, and more often than not, it symbolizes God's grace. It symbolizes God's goodness. It symbolizes God's favor towards us. If you recall one of the multiplying miracles that Jesus did, how many loaves did he multiply? Five. Five loaves. And in that showed thousands of people God's grace, goodness, and favor towards them. You know, David is on the run. Everything has been stripped away. And yet God grants five loaves. You know, it's a subtle little reminder that God has not left David alone, that God still cares. You know, those little symbols and signs can really help in those times where we feel all alone. It could be a kind word. It could be a simple Bible verse that just happens to pop in your mind. And I say that tongue-in-cheek. It doesn't just happen to pop in your mind. If you get a Bible verse that comes in your heart... <laughs> You should be so thankful. A subtle reminder that God still cares. It could be a free Coke. You're like, Chris, what do you mean? It's an interesting story. We were in Bible school together, Robin and I. And one, one of the things we did when we were in this discipleship group, we went down to the Buffalo River in Arkansas. Anybody ever been there? It's an awesome river. has a beautiful waterfall. So we were paired up. I wasn't paired up with Robin. We were not in love yet, so it didn't matter. But anyway... Robin was with our discipleship instructor, Keith, and this is a true story. She'll verify this. So they were just paddling down the river. Keith was standing up, as Keith is prone to do. 
Keith is a missionary who travels all over the world carrying the cross. That's what he does. You can look him up, kw.org. Well, anyway, he's canoeing down this river, Buffalo River, and all of a sudden, he dives into the river, leaving Robin all alone, just dives in. He comes up with a Mountain Dew. Keith's favorite drink is Mountain Dew. A subtle little reminder that God loves you. Isn't that incredible? Now, me, I would have left it there because I'm like, Mountain Dew. But, I mean, he saw Mountain Dew, and he dives in and grabs it. Those subtle little reminders that God still cares. Or maybe it's when you get away from the lights of the city, and you gaze up at the stars, and you begin to, as we were singing today, this big world, this big earth, and you go, wait a second, God's got all of that in the palm of... He's also got me. And sometimes we need those subtle reminders. And when we sing that song, I'm just reminded, he has it all. And he also has me. Because, see, it can be so easy for us to miss the subtle reminders of God's love and God's care for us. They are all around us if we just take the time to look and listen. So David's received bread. God's taking care of him. Then David goes on in verse 8, and he asked Ahimelech the priest, Do you have a spear or a sword? The king's business was so urgent. King's business was so urgent. He keeps it going, right? That I didn't even have time to grab a weapon. I only have the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Take that if you want it, for there's nothing else here. There is nothing like it, David replied. Give it to me. You know, we don't read the details of Goliath's sword, but we do read about the other weapons and the armor he had. This is what it said about Goliath. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. I haven't lifted 125 pounds for a long time. That's what he wore. He wore bronze leg armor, carried a bronze javelin. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead. That part alone weighed 15 pounds. You can only imagine that Goliath's sword would have been an incredible weapon, as David states, there is nothing like it. But the sword carried much more meaning than just a sword. It was a reminder, a very powerful reminder, of David's past victory. Of David's past victory. Of how God had helped him as a shepherd boy defeat a giant and keep him safe. God had done it before. He can do it again. You see, the story is, you know, he had five smooth stones. Those, that one stone knocked him down. You read the story. He goes and grabs Goliath's sword, and then he does, ready for this? Chops off his head. That's what that sword represents. You know, there's just so much we know, but we don't know. We don't apply to our situation to any situation that we face. For this sword should have been a reminder of all that God had done for him. How he protected him in battle after battle with the Philistines. How he protected him from Saul's spear attacks. You see, the truth is, David didn't defeat Goliath with lies and half-truths. He didn't defeat him that way. You're not going to win victories that way. He defeated the giant with a bold and audacious trust in God. Remember what he said? He gets before Goliath and he says, Today the Lord will conquer you. I will kill you. I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds. The whole world will know. The whole world will know that the Lord rescues. He will give you to us. I read that and I go, The Lord's will is to defeat the giant. The Lord's will is to defeat the giant. Count up the wills. And it's not for your glory. What's the glory for? So that the whole world will know that God rescues his people. That the whole world will know there is a Lord. There is a God and he's real and he's powerful. You see, David needed more than just that sword. At this point, David needs the faith that that sword represents because I want to say it again, that sword represents victory. David should have taken one look at that sword and been bolstered and built up in his faith and trust in God. He should have remembered all of that about what God had done in the past, what God is doing right now, and what would happen in the future. We should do the same, and even more so. After all, you and I, we can look back to the cross of Jesus, 
to his death and his resurrection, the ultimate victory. We win. We win. Holding that sword, I love the statement he makes, give it to me. Give it to me. You know, in Ephesians 6, when Paul describes the weapons of our warfare, he calls, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. David, understand, he knew that sword. He'd used it before. He'd used it before. Maybe we need to be that way when it comes to God's Word. Give it to me. God, I need it. Give it to me. But the truth is, we want to use God's Word, but we've got to know it. We can't use what we don't know. We can't use what we don't know. Do we know the Word of God as we can or as we should? And have we continually used it? Understand, the sword is not a defensive weapon. It is an offensive weapon. It empowers us to stand against all the enemy throws at us. Think about what Jesus did when he was tempted. He threw it right back at the enemy. And what did he use each and every time? But the Word of God. And if Jesus did it, maybe I should start applying that. Maybe that's what I should be filled with. And this is David. He's received the bread. He's received the sword. As one writer put it, God giving David that sword was such a beautiful reminder of God saying, don't be afraid. I've got you. Remember how we killed the giant together. Yes, Saul's no big deal. Saul was too afraid and too scared to actually fight Goliath. And I won't let him lay a finger on you. That's what's going on. So what is David's response? He's on the run from Saul. He's received bread and the sword of Goliath. Both of these reminders of God's grace, God's mercy, and his victory. David's response, verse 10. David escaped from Saul and went to King Achish of Gath. And I say it this way, the King James Version words it so aptly. David flees for fear of Saul. David, instead of running to God, runs to the godless. For he goes to the land of the Philistines, a very godless place. David literally flees to the land of his enemy, to the land of Goliath, for that is Goliath's hometown. David, full of love and passion for God, he's full of being human also. He's full of being human. From the outside, it's, it's hard to really blame David. The king is continually trying to murder you, so David just goes where that king is not. It makes sense, but that doesn't make it right. Sometimes it's difficult for us to grasp that. For just because we can justify disobedience doesn't make it right. Just because we can justify our decision as wrong as it is doesn't make it right. We're really good at justifying our actions. Have you noticed that? You, if you have children, you understand that. Even as adults, we like to justify our actions. And I have found you really don't have to justify much when you are simply following after God. It's when you begin to run from God that you have to come up with something. And in David, in running from God, is having to come up with something. And he goes to a godless land. Many commentators believe David was so wrong, he never should have gone there. It's not, it wasn't God's will for him. And you kind of notice that later as we look at one of the Psalms he writes. This is interesting in verse 11. The officers of Achish were unhappy about David being there. And they say, isn't this David the king of the land? They're already calling him, think about that. The enemy is calling David what? King. Okay, think about that. Isn't he the one that people honor with dances singing? Saul is killed as thousands and David is 10,000. Isn't this amazing? Even the Philistines knew of David and they sang his song. It's like a crossover hit. Number one in pop, number one in country. It's popular wherever you go. That's David. The enemy knows about David's victories. I think some of you need to hear that again. The enemy knows about your victory. The enemy knows, and they were none too pleased. They are afraid of David. The enemy is afraid of you. If you are walking with God, the enemy is afraid of you. We cower along, forgetting what we have. 
we cower when in reality the enemy cowers at the word of God, at the voice of God, at the power of God, at the God inside. We've got to stop cowering. The enemy knows. The enemy knew. The enemy knows God's on your side. And in verse 12, David keeps going. He hears these comments about this song they're singing, and he was very afraid of what King Achish of Gath might do to him. Fear is just, instead of being filled with trust and confidence in God, the complete opposite, which is fear, just continues to envelop him. You know, we have those times in our life where we wander into the land of the enemy thinking we can find escape. And before long, we are encaptured and we are ensnared. We are filled with fear. We just don't know what to do. So David acts like he's crazy so that the king gets rid of him to protect himself. You know, it's interesting. While David was in this land, when he was there, David wrote a couple psalms. And they teach us powerful lessons in how to make it through these times where we may be somewhere where we shouldn't, where the enemy seems to be all around us, where we feel all alone, where we feel like we're on the run, where we find ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. One writer, as I said before, he's not walking in what God has for him. Fear drove him to this enemy land. Fear is keeping him there, and it's literally captured him. Because when you read the heading of Psalm 56 that he wrote while he was there, it says when he was captured by the Philistines. So let's look at that psalm. I'm not going to read all of it, but there are some powerful truths on what do we do well, we've made that mistake. Look at the very first statement David makes in Psalm 56, verse 1. Oh God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. His very first action is to cry out to God for mercy. He doesn't hesitate to ask for mercy. God, spare me from what I really deserve. What a great definition of mercy. God, show me favor. Be gracious to me. Stoop in kindness to me. David is requesting mercy, and you really only request mercy when you've done something wrong. So David kind of knows, I should not have been there. Have you ever been in the wrong place, the wrong time? Maybe you're there right now. You're like, God, help me. Cry out for mercy. And he goes on, and he's very real. David writes, people are hounding me. My foes attack me. I'm constantly hounded, and many are attacking me. He speaks very truthfully about what is going on in his life. It's not pretty, it's real, and it's really scary. That is the situation David finds himself in. And maybe continually that is how you feel right now. And maybe this passage in verse 2 reads just like your diary would. God, everybody's attacking me, and you need mercy. So David writes all this. My enemies are around me, they surround me, they're always attacking me. And then he jumps right in in verse 3, and he says, but, always changes the trajectory of everything. All this is bad. Give me mercy. They're all against me. But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, O God. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Let's look at that. Are you afraid that you might not be able to pay your bills this month? When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Are you fearing the results of some medical test that you've recently taken? When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Are you troubled about what you see going on in this world and you're like, I don't even know what? When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Trust. You've got mercy. You've got trust. And then David goes on, even in this. And in verse 9, he says, My enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know. You hear me say this, God is on my side. That's David's words. It's so important that we remember this. I think we, God is on your side. God is on your side. He's literally the best. He's better than Bobby Witt. He's better than all of them. That's God on your side. Yet we live like he's not. He's on your side. I, don't, I can't say any. I can't even expect. I'm going to tell you what that says. I'm going to go theologically. God's on your team. God's on your side. I think if we would remember that verse, how much it would help us get through Tuesday and Thursday when things seem to be hounding us, that God is on our side. 
God is on our side. He goes, I praise God for what he's promised. I praise him for what he's promised. I trust in God. Why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? He says that twice. I've had to be reminded of that. What can mere mortals do? A few times in the past few weeks. For I've noticed it's so easy for us as human beings to build up a situation or even a person and make them a giant. We're really good at building giants in our minds. And it could be a situation, it could be just a person, and we've built that thing up or that situation or that whatever's going on in your life, and we've made what is just a total mortal person into a giant that looks like he's nine feet tall, that is armor that weighs 125 pounds. And they're just a person. And when we do that, we have a tendency to push the truth of the matter out that God is on my side. He also penned Psalm 34 about this time. I love this. When you look at the Psalms and you're able to put it to what is going on in his life, it's literally like looking into David's diary. What's going on in his life. And look at what he says in Psalm 34. For again, this time is not a high point in David's life. He's in a godless land, and, and he starts in verse 1 of chapter 34. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Come, let us all tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Praise. You've got mercy, you've got trust, and you've got praise. Do you know how powerful that is? Amen. To get you from thinking so much about what's hounding? Praise God. This whole chapter is basically a call to praise, and that's how he starts it. Praise God, and then he expounds on that, on why we should. You know, when we honor, when we praise God, I'm sorry, we honor and we commend him. We do this by singing with words, with music. We praise him with our lives and living lives surrendered to him. Simply put, praise is lifting God up. And when we praise God every Sunday morning when you're here, it, it helps us remember what God has done for us. We're thanking Him and remembering who He is. And we continue. When I leave on Sunday, after a time of worship, I am reminded God is on my side. Amen. God is on my side. And as we praise God, we can't help but be drawn into His presence. For it's such a powerful reminder. You put music on in your car, at home, whatever of how much more significant God is than the problems that plague us. We make our problems the giant, forgetting that we serve the most giant God of all. Amen. And that's not what God's best is for you. David goes on and says this, so we've got mercy, you've got trust, you've got praise, and then he says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Pray, pray. I, I, these are so simple for us to remember. Pray. I mean, look how simple these words are. I prayed. He answered. He freed me. Wow. You know, there is not a lot of, uh, of science in there. I pray. God answers. He frees me. That is pretty simple. He goes on and writes in verse 5, Those who look to God for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. And maybe this speaks of you. In my desperation... I prayed. Maybe that's you, and you're at Hail Mary time. But I'm telling you, it says in desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened. He still hears your Hail Marys. And he saved me from all my troubles. David was desperate in a foreign land, captured and desperately needing rescue. He goes on and says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, if you try God, and I'll tell you this, even for a little bit, you will not be disappointed. When you have a fear of God in your life and not people, you're going to notice a huge difference. So David just writes of such triumph and joy in this psalm. A psalm about people, literally in the low point of life, of how we can keep going, even have joy when the enemies are swirling all around us, trying to fill us with fear and doubt. And the praise, when you begin to praise God, it begins to fill you with a courage you never thought you'd have. And when you begin to pray, you receive the answers we so desperately need. You know, I'm sure you've heard of Michelangelo's David statue. You guys know what I'm talking about, the, 
the statue that Michelangelo created. What's really interesting about it is Michelangelo was an incredible artist and sculptor. And he accepted the commission to sculpt David in 1501. That's, uh, I'm not, wasn't around, anyway. He inherited a block of marble. I just found this so interesting because it's so true about David. He inherited a block of marble that two other sculptors had chipped, chiseled, and ultimately deemed unworkable, unusable. And certain characteristics of the statue of David, his slender, twisted figure, are likely due to the shape of the marble before Michelangelo began working on it. And here Michelangelo, the master, was able to make one of the most enduring statues of all time. And as I just came across that this week, we look at David because sometimes we're trying on our own and in our own strength. We're having other people try to work on us. And they've looked and they've tried, they've chiseled, they've this, they've that, and they say, unworkable. Yet when we put ourselves in the hands of the master, he can make something that lasts hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. When we surrender ourselves to the hands of God, it may not look good to begin with, but when God begins to chisel and chip off all the junk and all the crud, he takes something that the world deemed unworkable and makes them for God's glory. That's what God wants to do in us. You know, we look at David, he is not perfect. He is human just like we are, yet God never, ever gives up on David. He's never given up on you. You might have given up on you, but he hasn't. And we have all these things going on in our lives. And I'm telling you, there's reminders everywhere. You've got the Word of God, the Bible that is with you. And as you open that, it is a reminder each and every day, every time you open it, God still cares about me.